Welcome, Lama Jampa. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to be with you all. Okay, uh, the um, I believe everybody should have the text of the uh, Sedona we're using. Yeah, we added that in today's email. So uh, yeah, everyone should find that in their inbox. If you are on that call, you got the email, so you have that Sadhana that Lama Jumper will be using. Yeah, so um, if you don't have it, then you can just follow. But if you go to page four of that particular text, there's refuge in generating bodhicitta. Uh, I would like us to do that uh, based on this text, okay? So, but before we do anything like that, we should, of course, uh, recognize our motivation. And what I really like love so much about Miller Rafa was, was that he didn't have anything. He didn't have a monastery. He didn't have, you know, uh, like all of the trappings of the, that we have nowadays. And not to say that our present gurus who might have monasteries and such have have a problem. It just there's a certain purity in that, uh, in just that they're they're a complete renunciate. Um, similarly, if we uh, think of uh, for example, uh, uh, Kunalama Tenzin Gelson, uh, he, he was a, he was a recent teacher. He only died a, maybe a 30 years ago or something, 20 years ago. He was incredibly renounced. I mean, he had nothing. And yet he was a teacher for the Dalai Lama uh, for Bodhicitta. And then he wrote a text of uh, 360 verses of praise of Bodhicitta. Just an incredibly renounced being. Um, I actually got to meet him. I, I, I particularly sought him out. I wanted to receive Bodhisattva vows from him. So I went to Sopema. This is 19, I think 1979, I guess, um, with another monk. And the two of us arrived in a little village of Sopema. Uh, then we went looking for, you know, the Kuna Lama Tenzing Gelson, the very famous Lama. We were directed to a little stone hut and, uh, you know, mud walls, mud floor. Uh, we had to climb up to the second floor on a basically a log with little grooves cut into it, uh, arrived up there and then sitting in the corner wrapped with a blanket wrapped around him, I mean, basically on a mat and with glasses as thick as Coke bottle bottoms, you know, I mean, that and, and almost no teeth. That was Tensei, the Kuna Lama Tensei Gelson. I mean, he could have been living in a monastery and all the praise and the Dalai Lama's tutor. I could have had anything, and yet he'd renounced it all. It was just him, and then uh, he had an assistant, uh, Kadroma, who was taking care of him. And I was deeply moved by that, just because uh, you could, I mean, you could say we don't want to overemphasize renunciation, and actually in Buddhism, that's a really bad word. Uh, it's called spiritual determination. Renunciation is like you're looking backwards and saying, I renounce this, I renounce that. Uh, in Buddhism, we have what's called Nejum, which is a spiritual uh, determination or such. Uh, and what it refers to is I'm going somewhere. It's quite different than renunciation. You know, if you go somewhere, yeah, you might leave some things behind, but you're not focused on that. You're focused on going somewhere with yourself. So anyway, Kuna Lama Tenzin Gelsen, I would think, would be uh, at this time uh, one of the more, you know, uh, recent, really Mil Milarepa you know, emanations. And then, of course, we have uh, Mingir Rinpoche, who's, uh, you know, of course, now very popular and everything. But he, you know, uh, you know there's his book, and, and he escaped his monastery and went off and lived for three years, you know, in, in the forest. He almost died from uh, food poisoning and things. I mean, very precious, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, and now we know about him, and so he's sort of super popular and things. I mean, I'm sure he still has his very clear feelings about you know, what's important and not important. But again, here's a, another example. And then there are many others, uh, great lamas. I mean, for example, my, my own teacher, uh, Geshe Raptan, um, here he was, he was one of the top Geshe's in Tibet until the Chinese invaded. Uh, then he, of course, escaped. And he didn't just go into a monastery and, and you know, become a, a teacher of students. He went off, he did a three-year retreat of actually Yamantaka, uh, and things, and just after that finished, then uh, I actually got to meet him, and I took my my refuge vows from him. Sorry, give me a second. I have to turn my phone off. I'm so sorry about that. I always forget to do that. Sorry, my apologies for that. So the invasive phones. Okay, so uh, Geshe Raptan, uh, and then when I met him, he lived in a, a little mud hut. It would have been maybe two meters by three meters with a slate roof on it. And that's what he lived in, you know, and he was, you know, up on the side of the mountain above Dharamsala with the Dalai Lama. And he was doing, you know, Shine and completion stage practices and such. And so, although not, you know, I mean, 
I mean, there's just uh, what I like to point out is is that you know often we think of that maybe the Kargyupa and Nyingmapa lamas are the ones who do all the big retreats. And no, uh, especially the lamas that came out of Tibet. Uh, that a lot of them in the Nagalupa, very serious. And if you sort of think about why. Well, if when you're in Tibet, there's a whole cultural environment that supports you, everything's just wonderful, you know, uh, and things, you know, I mean, you basically do your practice and stuff. And then the Chinese invade, and so you escape. And so if your Dharma practice was basically socially supported, you might lose it, which, of course, hundreds of monks and nuns did so. But uh, some of the monks that, that basically really were sincere in their Dharma practice, I mean, they come back to the mother country of India, where Buddhism came from, and Dharamsala was very close to where Tilopa uh, lived and Tilopur and such, uh, that they really were sincere and we could say much more real in their practice. Uh, I think of it as like if you have uh, un unclean wheat, you know, and then you start you you start chaffing it to get rid of all of the the, the husks on on the wheat. That's sort of what the Chinese invasion of Tibet did: is it got rid of all the superficial people that were maybe good people, but they didn't really have a deep sense for the practice. And then the ones that were left were the real core, the real the real uh, people that really were deeply dedicated. And so I'm sure in but whether it's Nyingma Pakarbyupa, Gelupa, Sakyapa, that really the regular monks that really continued to be a monk after the Chinese invasion really had a dedication to the Buddha Dharma. So this whole teaching is about that, that this that there are some beautiful people out there that really have sincere deep practice. Um, you know, maybe some of you have met some uh, now. I don't, I'm not up on the, you know, lived in India for about 30 years now. <laughs> the thing is, I'm sure there's still some out there. So with anyway, with the motivation that uh, I'm attending this, not only for myself, but may I be a benefit to the people in my life? May I have some of the realization, spiritual determination of Miller Ray, but may I have some of his, his great love and compassion for the benefit of all sentient beings. And even he brings you know, local spirits into, into enlightenment. Uh, may I have that? So with that thought in mind, then on page four, we have one and two, uh, taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. That's the prayer I'm going to do. And of course, we should think of Jetsam Milarepa in front of us. Namo Jetsam Sherpa Dorji, Supreme Guru, who is the nature of the three kayas. I and all sentient beings of the three realms respectfully take refuge in you with our three doors. Namo Jetsan Shippa Dorji, the Supreme Guru, who is the nature of the three Kayas. I and all sentient beings of the three realms respectfully take refuge in you with our three doors. Namo Jetsan Shippa Dorji, the Supreme Guru, who is the nature of the three Kayas. I and all sentient beings of the three realms respectfully take refuge in you with our three doors. Ah. Uh, in order for sentient beings who have been drowned in the ocean of innate and fabricated ignorance, and for those based in suffering, the aggregates are bound by the rope of dualistic mind to obtain the great bliss. I actualize the guru. I shall actualize the guru. Ah, uh, in order for sentient beings who are drowned in the ocean of innate and fabricated ignorance, whose base of suffering, the aggregates, are bound by the rope of dualistic mind. To obtain the great bliss, I shall actualize the Guru. Ah, in order for sentient beings who are drowned in the ocean of innate and fabricated ignorance and whose base of suffering, the aggregates, are bound by the rope of dualistic mind, to obtain the great bliss, I shall actualize the Guru. Okay, now, before we start, uh, I did want to go and do, do things. Now, there are some uh, things that uh, Jonas will share, but this is based on the Yogacharya or Chittamantran philosophy. And I, I need to review that just so you have some idea of what, what we're talking about. Uh, it'll be one of the, the uh, papers that uh, Jonas will share. So basically, in Buddhism, we have the two truths, relative and ultimate. Okay, that's just sort of it. We categorize everything, and that's everything. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if you're a Christian, you have God as the ultimate, and then we are the relative. Well, we're Buddhist, so we have the two truths, the ultimate truth. That is nothing beyond that. And then we have relative, which depends on your particular philosophy. So for the Chittamantra or Yogacharya, uh, the two truths, relative truth, what's happening around us, is false. It is not truly existent. 
ultimate truth is true. Okay, so that's one thing. And there's three qualifications, which are really interesting. First off, everything is a reflection of your mind. Okay, that's really important. Like whatever you're experiencing, looking at this, like right now you're looking at the screen or you're looking at, at my image, you're only seeing what you understand of me. Maybe if you're a friend of mine, you might know me a little bit more and then something a little bit more is reflecting. If not, then you know, you're just sort of thinking, oh, Jampa and you know, whatever, he spent some years in India and whatever. Point. So, but the point is, you only see a reflection of your mind. That's a pro profound philosophy. Why? Because you become the owner of your experience. That is unbelievably powerful. You know, we always blame other people for things that happen, the problems, the suffering in our lives and stuff. You know, that person did this to me and that person did that to me. Well, it depends how you reflect it off of that experience. I mean, you could have a trauma or some very nasty thing happen, but you could turn it into a source of your wisdom and compassion. So the same object becomes that. Now, that's not easy. It might take you several years to, to work through a, a trauma, but the bottom line is it is just a reflection of your mind. The philosophy is magnificent. In fact, most great meditators rely on this philosophy more than they do in the Majjhimika because it's so much more easy Majjhimika is good. You can actually take Majjhimika a little bit and apply it into this, but basically we're going to stick with the Chittamantra philosophy. So first of all, everything's the reflection of your mind, but it has three qualities. Okay, uh, number one is diluted projections. We think everything exists externally. Now, you might think, well, hey, fire burns. It's not just my mind. No, 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 but that, that's your, 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 how you experience fire depends on your mind. I mean, if you had, for example, high yogic realizations, fire wouldn't burn you. <laughs> so it depends on your mind. Okay, but anyway, so first off, just, uh, we feel things exist externally. And then the second part, which is really interesting, is everything is other powered. And these words are really important. It's like, for example, at the start, I said, renunciation is not a good translation of our Buddhist practice. We have spiritual determination. That's the proper Tibetan word. Even the word ignorance is not the correct word, really. The Tibetan is rikpa or ma rikpa. Rikpa is I understand, ma rikpa is I don't understand. Now, translators will turn it into ignorance, but it's just really the negative of understanding. So you could understand. The, the language is profound. But anyway, you don't need to study Tibetan language. Just you, We need to have good translations. So all phenomena are other powered. So... When you look at something, for example, if you look at me, I'm powered by my mother and my father. I'm powered by the food I ate this morning and this afternoon. I'm powered by the air I'm breathing. I am other powered. I am not the owner of who I am. I am powered by others. So when you look at an object, you take away its overemphasis. When you look at somebody, you look at your partner, you look at your, your host, you look at your pet dog or cat, they are other powered. So although you see them, you could say you divest them of being independently self-existent, or you can say you divest them of being, uh, you know, other than you know, projecting your mind. But first off, let's just say that they are other powered. So the effect on your consciousness is you are more free when you look at something. You don't overemphasize it because it is other power. And then whatever you identify, for example, if you identify the air, okay, I am other power because I'm breathing. Well, then the air is other power by other factors, for example, where I am right now, it's quite warm, where you are, it might be winter or fall, you know, so it depends. So everything is other power, which divests it of being overemphasized. And finally, point number three of relative truth, it is non-dual, uh, okay. A non-dual direct perception is true and valid. Okay, so, sorry. So the proper philosophical thing is a non-dual direct perception is valid and true, which this means is, is that if you understand non-duality, although everything appears external, it's just a play of other power, and it is non-dual with my mind. Okay, and then a non-dualistic uh, perception that would be of the nature of your mind is true and valid. Okay, then the ultimate truth is a non-dualistic mind. Okay, so the relative truth, three things. We okay, the, 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 okay, knowledgeables are a reflection of the mind, which has three qualities. We feel that they exist externally. 
we should understand that they are other powers and that there is a, a relative non-dual perception, and that's true, non-dual perception of what the non-dualistic mind, that is true. And then the final thing is there are eight consciousnesses, and this is actually quite nice, it sort of makes it nice and simple compared to sometimes philosophy. It says there's eight consciousnesses. You have your five senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Then you have a diluted mind, and then you have a mind basis of all, and sorry, a mind, so I'm sorry, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Then six, number six is the mind. Then you have a diluted mind, and then you have mind basis of all. Now, mind basis of all is more or less dharmakaya, um, and then the diluted mind is a, a, your mind that doesn't understand. Remember, it's the marikva, I don't understand. The mind is just your basic mind, your personality, your emotions, your feelings, and things like that. And then you have your five senses. So if you were to free yourself from a diluted mind, you would have still mind, you have five senses, and you have the mind basis of all. Okay, I don't want to get into it. You can study that on your own, but basically it'll come up in the text I'm going to follow. Okay, so first we're going to do a transmission of the mantra. Okay, because this that I, some of you might not attend all the teachings. This could go on for quite a while. Uh, I'm not quite sure how long. Already it's 20 minutes, so uh, I'm not sure how long I'm going to teach. But um, okay, so we should feel uh, that we are a sincere practitioner, uh, that we wish to be a benefit both to ourselves and to others. And then we're going to say, please, uh, Jetson Miller, uh, Jetson Miller Repa, please help me. Uh, in my practice, you know, you are a missing, you obtain full liberation, um, and uh, you're going to receive a transmission. Now, this is not an initiation, but it is a transmission. So way back when, uh, the time of Milarepa, whether it was Red Chumba or any of his other, or, or Gompopa maybe, um, that would be the thing that then they received his mantra. And then from, Mil uh, let's say, Gompopa, he gave it to then down to the Kar Kar Karmapas, and then from the Karmapas it came down. And then actually, Lama Zopra Poche was who I received it from, you know, in Nepal. And he was actually very non-sectarian. I mean, he was just so simple and pure. I mean, if the Buddha said something, he believed it. He had that sort of purity of faith. And if you've ever attended his teachings, you, you would understand that. But what was really special about Lama Zopra was that it's so nice that somebody just completely believed in the words of the Buddha. You know, nowadays, I mean, myself included, we we adjust things because, you know, we don't want to be too heavy duty about stuff or whatever, you know. I mean, it's sort of like, let's make it a, adaptable for the Western culture. And I was open, I mean, he did make it adaptable, but he also just for personally, he totally believed that anything the Buddha said was absolute truth. You know, it was, it was like, it was to be totally have faith in. And so he had that type of mind. So I received from this from him in Nepal. Uh, he gave me the transmission of the mantra. I've done it every day ever since. Um, I don't do a lot. You can do you could three, seven, 21, or you could do a mala as you wish. Depends on how much you know, karma you want to accumulate. Um, I do have the tonka. I actually have a statue of Milarepa too. Uh, it's on, on our altar here at our Dharma Center. So uh, the main point being is, is, is that uh, we are sincere practitioners, and we have the 100,000 songs of Milarepa, which I must have read many times, so inspiring and so moving, and, and such a wonderful world that he moved in, you know, and he just wandered around. I mean, nowadays, he would be a bag person or a street person, really. You know, that's the way he looked. I mean, and even worse, he didn't even have any clothes on, you know, and yet he'd show up to your door begging and then you say, well, what's this, you know, I'll get him some food, you know, because he smells and he's dirty and he's skinny and he's slightly colored green, you know, like that. Well, that, that was Milarepa. Now, of course, as time passed and whether he was walking in Tingri or other parts around the Himalayas, you know, they came to know of him and of course, then had huge respect for him because, I mean, he, he seldom ate food. He was an incredible yogi. I mean, so moving. And I mean, some of you may have gone to Tibet, you know, either you go to Tingri, you can see the, the house that I think it was built by, they built for Marpa and all sorts of stuff in the caves. Um, there, you know, there's no, these are no pilgrimage sites. So lots of things. So this is what we're getting a connection with, but we're getting a live connection. I, I received it. I've done the mantra respectively. Uh, I've never done a retreat for Milarepa, but I've had great faith in him. So you are getting a valid transmission of the mantra. I've done it every day ever since I got it, and then like that. 
Okay, so with those thoughts in mind then, uh, feel that like in my heart, there's a moon cushion. And on that moon cushion going clockwise is this mantra. And when I recite it, like little flames uh, of the syllables come out my mouth, enter into your mouth and settle in your heart on a moon cushion on your heart. Now, if you've got multiple practices, just you sort of let the other ones disappear a little bit and you're focused on receiving the mantra of Milarepa. And so with a feeling of, not only for myself, but for the people in my family, the people I meet, for all sentient beings. May I have a pure practice. May I be pure and free of all of the eight worldly winds, which normally push us around. Just like Milarepa was free of those eight worldly winds, may I be free of eight worldly winds. With this thought, may I purely receive the mantra of Jetson Mila. Please repeat after me. Om A Guru. Om A Guru. Hasavadra. Hasavadra. Sarva City. Sarva City. Pala Hum. Pala Hum. Om A Guru. Om A Guru. Hasavadra. Hasavadra. Sarva City. Sarva City. Pala Hum. Pala Hum. Om A Guru. Om A Guru. Hasavadra. Hasavadra. Sarva City. Sarva City. Allah Home. Allah Home. Okay, all together. Om A Guru Hasa Vajra Sarva City. Allah Home. Om A Guru Hasa Vajra Sarva City. Allah Home. Om A Guru Hasa Vajra Sarva City. Allah Home. Now, uh, just in case you're curious, the meaning a little bit, there's the often mantras don't have a lot of meaning, but Om A Guru is Om A Body. Om body, ah, uh, speech, guru, hasa vajra, laughing vajra. Hasa means laughing. Uh, vajra, of course, indestructible. So the indestructible laughing vajra. Um, Sarva city, all the realizations. Pala normally means protect. Home, may I become one with my mind. So om, ah, guru, hasa vajra. So that's identifying Milarepa. Sarva city, Pala. Oh, please but give me, please bestow, give, protect all the realizations. Whom may it be one with my mind. Okay, so you've now received the transmission of the mantra. Okay, uh, for those of you that missed it, um, you know, I, actually, strictly speaking, I mean, you should be live. I don't know how many people are online right now, it doesn't matter. But the thing is, even if you don't, if you watch this later, uh, and you think, oh, gee, I didn't get it live. It doesn't matter. I mean, you still, <laughs> Miller Rape was omniscient, you know, so you'll still, uh, you can still connect with him. But if you should have the opportunity, uh, then take this mantra from another practitioner. Now, there are different mantras in this particular sadhana. At one point, there's a different mantra for, for, for Miller Rape. Um, I don't have all the different mantras. I'm sure there's many lineages and I mean, even the Kargyu lineage is like, I mean, I think 10 different Kargyu lineages. So it's not like you're going to get exactly the same one in every one of those lineages. But this is the main mantra. Om uh, uh, Guru Hasavadra Sarva Siddhi Pala Om. Okay, that's the main mantra for everybody. So uh, if you do listen to this at a later date, you can still say this mantra. It's not a problem. But if you could get seek out somebody to receive it from uh, in a living situation and you know, it's only this dilemma says now things online are living. I mean, I'm in Mexico right now and you guys are somewhere in the world. So it is a living transmission. OK, and um, just for example, uh, it, it, like when I took my Bodhisattva vows, I, I took them back in 1971, you know, when I received my first teachings. But later in 1979, so when I went and sought out uh, Kunalema Tenzin Gelson, you know, the great yogi and renunciate and such, uh, that, you know, I was really, I, I wanted to meet somebody who you'd say really walked the talk, really lived an incredibly aesthetic life as a yogi. And he had it and he, nothing, he was nothing but bodhicitta. You know, yes, he was maybe some tantric deities and some other things, but really he was just bodhicitta on a relative level, Nirmanakaya, he was bodhicitta. And so as much as I was very lucky to do that, I would recommend it if you can in the future, if you miss the actual transmission of the mantra, that you seek someone out. And even then in the future, if you go to India or maybe a great Lama comes to uh, wherever, wherever you live, uh, you can possibly ask for the mantra. Maybe you'll do it as a, a group teaching or something. It might be a little different. Again, as you said, there's different transmissions, lineages. 
Uh, but the thing is, is that you've now received it. Okay, so we're on page three, uh, just preliminaries. And I'm going to go over this a little bit briefly. Uh, you know, we don't have a, well, I don't want to tie up your time a really long time. This will be available on YouTube at a later date. So first, the first preliminary is done according to the levels of the practitioner in general. I make an eight petaled uh, mandala of arranged red grain. So you get uh, wheat or if you, you get red, red um, or those orange um, uh, lent, lentil, lentils. Uh, they could work with red, red, be, red seeds. Normally you'd get wheat and you dye it red. That's what the Tibetans would do. And you make a little image of an eight-petaled lotus. In the center of it, you put a picture of uh, Jetson Milarepa. And in front of that, then you put a, a torma. Now, you do not need to know some fancy way that a Tibetan makes a torma. Uh, and again, every monastery will be a little different than making tormas. It's just different lineages. But uh, cookies, I mean, that's what I, I use cookies all the time because that's sort of easy. Kyabji uh, Lingren Poche, one of my very first teachers, uh, he just said, torma means food. So just food, so cookies, or if you want to make something more special, uh, a cake or something. The thing that's nice with cookies is they do last a little bit longer. If you did it, for example, a one month retreat and the cookies are wrapped in saran wrap, then they'll stay in good condition all day. Okay, so you have a, a torma, uh, okay, and then around it, you can put other little bits of cookie, which is just small bits of torma. To the right and left, put medicine. I, I guess we put an aspirin. <laughs> it says rakta. Now, rakta is blood. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you would do with that. I mean, you don't need to punch yourself in the nose or cut your finger or something and put blood there. That's a bit silly. But just you could visualize something. Uh, you can get red food dye and put a little bit in a little dish or something like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be real blood, uh, symbolic. Yeah, and uh, why is blood, blood, I mean, generally speaking, blood is considered sort of the, the essence of life. You know, if you don't have blood, you die. So uh, in that way, it's considered sort of an, an essential thing. Okay, in front of that, uh, places seven types of offerings. It's Argon, Bajan, Buzbe, that's your standard offerings. It could be eight. Eight would be then your uh, music. And if you if you have a Bajan bell, then of course your bell is number eight. So the seven offerings. Gather the substances. Now it says here, molasses, honey, sugar, meat, alcohol, and so on. Uh, basically, soak. The most minimum for soak is what's called nada and bala. So that's meat and alcohol, okay? Dried meat or dried alcohol. Now, if you're a vegetarian, you might say, oh, gee whiz. So what it has to be is it has to be high protein. Basically, the practice of tantra means your body has to be really healthy. And so, for example, uh, I mean, Milarepa, there's a great story about the, uh, Marpa wrote a letter, he, he wrote a letter and sealed it, put it all together and gave it to Milarepa and says, only when you have a serious problem should you open this letter, only then. And so Milarepa went off and I mean, incredible. He, even before he left uh, in Marpa, he would sit and he'd put a butter lamp on the crown of his head. You know, I mean, it's a little one, it's not a really big one, you know, and he would meditate and not move until it went out. He was seriously motivated. Now, in one way you can say, well, why? Well, he killed 34 people. <laughs> He's, he's done something pretty heavy. I, I think that, you know, I mean, on one side, you know, he's a holy being, he became holy, but on a relative side, he did something pretty nasty. And so he, you know, he, 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 he let's say he wanted to purify and stuff. And so he had big motivation. You know, you and I, we, I mean, we can't have done anything like that. I mean, you know, we'd be in prison, uh, but maybe if you are in prison and you're watching this, I mean, you've got an opportunity, maybe you can do quite a bit of practice. I don't know that the rules and regulations of prison, but the thing is that, that he had done something really intense. And so he really wanted purification. So he really applied himself. And that's why he would sit until a butter lamp burned out and such. Okay. Anyway, so the point being is, is, is that, uh, that you, the, the, the having, okay, sorry, come back to the story. Um, so he meditated and he, and he, he had high level samadhi, he had tumo, he had all of those things. And then his sister found him at a certain point. She was still alive. His mother had died. And his father, of course, had died when he was very young. Uh, and his sister sort of found him, was so moved. She said, my brother, you know, I'm going to take care of you. So she started bringing him very much more healthy food quite regularly uh, and such. Anyway, and so he started eating a little bit better. And then he had all these problems because his body woke up. 
you know, his body suddenly had protein. And so then that's where he then started freaking out. He'd have all sorts of weird thoughts. Not that the calorie were freaked out, but he got concerned. So then he opened Marpa's letter and that's where then he got taught the true core, like the, the, the exercises of the Naro, of six yogas of Naropa and other things. And it explained to him, your body, which you've now, you know, you were so aesthetic, but you did incredible purification. Your body is waking up now. And so therefore, you know, please take care of yourself. And these are some things you can do. So when you talk about meat and alcohol, what you're really talking about is high protein food. Now, I don't know if the Tibetan lamas would agree with this, but if you're a vegetarian, I guess you could put some, you know, acorn nuts or something, or, you know, uh, almond nuts or something, because that's a high protein alcohol. Well, you do transform it. And I mean, if you're a really sincere practitioner, you just feel that you transform the meat and alcohol as bliss and voidness and you take them. Um, you know, the, the funny thing, and you know, I'm going to get off topic too much on this, but, uh, you know, if you're a really good practitioner, especially a high tantra, and you happen to be a vegetarian, uh, it could be you dream of eating meat. And then you wake up in the morning, you think, oh, I'm so bad. I've been eating meat, you know, I'm broke. Like, what's wrong with me? I must be evil, you know, <laughs> it's a crazy mind. No, it's just a dream image of power. High protein is power. And when you dream of it, like eating meat or such, it refers to having high power. So anyway, I'm off topic a bit, but it's an interesting thing. So anyway, you do need meat and alcohol. If you really sort of can't handle that, then maybe some really high protein nuts and alcohol. Okay. Uh, and it's just basically, they're both high protein. That's the bottom line. Okay. Uh, then you have taking refuge. Okay. Then you visualize in front of you, Guru um, Jetson Mipa. Now, Shepa Dorji. Shepa in Tibetan is, uh, this is on page four if you're lost, uh, the thing Namo Jetson uh, Shepa Dorji. Uh, Jets, uh, Shepa means laughing or, you know, happy laughing. Dorji is Vajra, is indestructible. So he's, he's a laughing Vajra, okay, or smiling Vajra. The Supreme Guru, you take refuge in him, you generate Bodhicitta. And here's where it comes up, the Chittamantra philosophy. Uh, or it says, uh, all the sentient beings are bound by the rope of dualistic mind. Now, what's really nice with the Chittamantra or Yogacharya school of philosophy is that basically, when you look at anything, you're only seeing a reflection of your mind. So if you're seeing something nice, you're looking at a nice reflection of your mind. If you're looking at something ugly, well, you've got maybe a delusion or something like that. So that's where, for example, having bodhicitta May all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness, even if they're the, you know, Hamas in, 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 in Israel or in the, in, in the you know, Gaza, you know, like that. They just want happiness and they're doing it all in the wrong way, you know. So they're, they're truly an object of love and compassion, compassion, definitely. Anyway, so that is, if you look at the Hamas and you have a sense of compassion for them, you possibly are closer to a non-dualistic mind. Whereas if you look at them and you hate them, well, then you're just creating a karma of hatred, and that doesn't benefit. Anyway, so it's, it's, this is the first doorway of the first thing that says, okay, we are in Chittamantra philosophy, dualistic mind. Okay, uh, then we go to the seven branches. And so, again, I'm going to just slightly go over it. This is sort of to help you with your practice. Uh, to the great jets and whose beautiful performed a dance is the emanation of the sphere of the unborn. Okay, the unborn. Now, if you study a little bit, both, you know, Majamika or Chittamantra, really doesn't matter. No phenomena was ever born. Uh, now, Nagarjuna is the most wonderful commentary on this. He says, our ignorance is that we feel that something exists. But the thing is, it never came into existence. It is unborn. Now, it's there. It's got its dynamics. It's other-powered. Remember, we're in a Chittamantra philosophy. But it's just a dynamic, and my mind wants to maybe isolate one moment of it and say, this is really existent. There's our delusion. A dualistic mind this is just a reflection of my mind, and I understand it's a dynamic of other powered phenomena, and I don't see it as being external and such. Anyway, so there's the uh, unborn. By recollecting the mode of existence, I make prostrations, I make offerings, purify collection. Okay, now here again, it's, it's a chitta mantra recollection and recollected objects. That's duality. 
I confess the grasping of recollection and recollected objects. I rejoice the freedom from elaborations of recollection and recollected objects. Please turn the wheel of Dharma, which is uh, in which the difference is of one taste. It's the one taste of reality that it's just all a reflection of my mind, and my mind is the you know innate bliss and voidness. Okay. Uh, I request you to remain in a non-meditative in in a non-meditative state. So it means it means please please teach, and I dedicate the ver various collections which are free from all expectations. Okay. Now, and just the what, what are the seven branches? And there you could spend years doing seven branches. I'm humble and I appreciate. I'm inspired by you, the Buddhas. I make offerings to you because you're wonderful. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, you make them give them presents, don't you? Well, in this case, you know, fall in love with the gurus and the Buddhas. Okay, you make offerings to them. Uh, you are open. Okay, the actual Tibetan word for confession is shakpa, which means to open up. So, you know, if you go back maybe sometime in the past and you did something that really you don't want anybody to know about because it was so bad. You know, so you sit there and you say, oh, God, I don't want to know about that. So when you come to the Buddha, you say, okay, I take refuge in you, but please don't ask me about that. You know, you've not made a confession. You've not, well, it's not confession. You haven't opened up. Now, when you open up, you say, whoa, that was really shitty. That was horrible. But I don't want to repeat it. That's your purification. It, it, you, you, you could say you embrace the fact that you were misinformed or unintelligent or not very aware you did something really hurtful and painful and so you have to touch it and then you say okay i never want to do that again and i'm sorry that i did it you know like that so it's not guilt it's just completely different than guilt i mean that's confession rejoice is hey i get off on anything that's virtuous and beautiful and wonderful you know if someone opens the door in front of you going into a store be happy about that rejoice they just did something nice. They opened the door for somebody else. Now, that's a simplistic version of it. But the thing is, rejoice at positive things. Uh, turn the wheel of Dharma. So uh, please teach and please remain uh, you know, with us always. You know, If you're a really wonderful person, please stay in my neighborhood. That's, please remain. And not just stay there, but please help us teach. And I dedicate my virtuous actions to, uh, to becoming enlightened. Then uh, we move to number four. Ah, the deity is mine. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, go, I'm going a little fast, but I want to cover everything. And again, it's not a detailed presentation, but it's good to sort of have a bit of an overview. Ah, the deity is mine. It is also demon is mine. There is no de de deity or demon that doesn't come from the mind. Dispel a dualistic conception of thought, which appears to the demon, appears as a demon, with the Vajra mind, which is free of conceptions. Now, this is, if you, of course, read the, uh, you know, the great hundred thousand songs of Milarepa. I think it's called the the Red Dog. Uh, you know, Cloud Mountain or something. There's a, there's a cave he was in, and and a demon started to bother him, and so he confronted the demon. Uh, you know, in the sense that he gave it Dharma teachings. So the thing is, if you have a demon in your life, give it Dharma teachings. You know, I, I mean, whether we really believe in spirits. And I think we should have an open mind that, 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 that there are entities which we don't, can't perceive. That would be realistic. But the thing is, even if so, have that open mind. But if something comes up in your mind and you think, oh my God, that's horrible. Oh my God, that's horrible. Then give it some Dharma teachings. It's just a reflection of your mind. You know, that's a very interesting, isn't it? It's like, it's a really, it's a shift of perspective when you do this, okay? Hum hum utsa taya pe, and I'm not up on what the mantras mean on all these mantras. And then establishing the boundary, aha, this is making your your what's your your vajra 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 protection. Ah, ah, the vajra tent, which is the nature beyond samsara, is not an option to be protected, and there's no one to be protected. The wrathful wisdom protects the mind. I have heard, I had I we had a in my in the Dharma Center that I ran in Canada, it was my house actually, and we had a Dharma Center. Uh, we started to build a stupa, and I, you know, I had some, I had a, I had construction plans for it and everything. But at a certain point, you know, we came to that we have the foundation, which is the throne, and we didn't know what to do. And then one day, I was asked to come and translate. I was in, I was living in Canada. I was in Duncan on Vancouver Island. And someone phoned him and says, please, can you come down to uh, Victoria and translate for this lamb? He's a Karkupa. I said, sure, I'm happy. I, I was translating for Sakya Palama at that time anyway. So I went down 
And I start translating for him. And then somewhere in there, I mentioned, oh, we're trying to build a stupa. And he says, oh, oh, I built stupas. And I said, oh, really? And he says, yeah, I, I just built the, what is it, the 100-foot tall stupa for Car 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 Calorum Poche. I went, really? And he said, oh, yeah, and I built other stupas all over. So here it is. I'm on the edge of North American Island, on Vancouver Island. And lo and behold, this Tibetan Lama shows up, a monk, and, and he he built stupas, and I needed a stupa builder. So then it's sort of as funny as it was, this is just sort of stories. Um, he went back to Vancouver, and then there was some politics or something like that, and, and whatever it is that the organizing committee didn't want him, and they asked him to leave. And so he phoned me up and said, uh, can I please come over and stay with you for a little while? And of course, I need somebody to build a stupa. <laughs> and so he came over and he lived with us for what, three or four months. We made the perfect stupa. I mean, this guy knew how to build stupas and he lived with us for three months and he, made, he did the, the tree, the, I mean, all of the things that you do with a stupa, so great. Anyway, so why am I saying all of this? That the uh, that in regards to protection, Kalarim Poche, it said that if you came close to his retreat house, you had a vision that you were looking at a wall of fire. I heard that. So uh, interesting. So he he felt that he was inside of a protection wheel. Uh, again, I mean, if you if you studied higher tantra, you know, you normally have a, like a, a vajra floor, vajra sense, vajra roof, vajra ceiling. Outside of that, you have a well, a wheel of fire going around it with vajra darts and vajra arrows flying in it and stuff like that. Anyway, om vajra raksha raksha. That's the protection launcher. So you feel that you are in a sacred space, in a protected space. And although it says there's no one to be protected and there's nothing to protect, uh, you have a state of, well, if you had a non-dualistic mind, you would have that, okay? You would have that protection. Or actually, you know, I'm going, um, Tritur Rinpoche, uh, you, when he gave one initiation, I got to be his translator, uh, very precious. Um, and then if he gave you a little blessing cord, like if you've ever attended initiations, you know, you get a little cord uh, at the beginning of them. And so he, he, he sat there and he blessed it and he gave it to us. And really, I mean, so precious, you know, we got something from him. So he then explained it. He said, well, actually, this represents you, your whole body because it's normally about five feet, six feet long. It's folded three times to represent your body, speech, and mind. And it has three knots in it to say, I'm protecting your body, speech, and mind. And it's always colored red. So he said, well, okay, so I've done prayers. I'm protecting your Vajra speech and mind. Okay, so everything's good. Okay, but he says, do you want to know what the real protection is? It's the color, it's the red color. It represents love. And if you have great love for all sentient beings, you are always protected. Yeah. So whether you have a non-dualistic mind or whether you have deep love, you are protected. Okay, blessing the substances, externally, six mistaken migrators, the peerless offering of the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body, internally, the eight consciousnesses. So there's your eight consciousness of the Chittamantra philosophy. Peerless offering of Sambhogakaya, the fully enjoyment, secretly, the great exalted wisdom of the bliss and emptiness, the peerless offering of the Dharmakaya, which is, of course, the uh, mind basis of all. Uh, these actually arranged substances, which are free from the conception of true existence, are the peerless offering of the two collections. So, an Oma home. So, in this, you make a blessing. Now, the simplest version of blessing is Oma home, but if you understand reality, uh, you know, that things are not independently self existent and they're not separate from your mind and they're other powered, then that is the real blessing. Okay, now we come to the actual practice. We're on page six. Okay. Uh, Okay, then again, I'm reviewing this and I'm not seeing if there's any more questions or anything, but maybe at the end we can do some questions. Okay, uh, ah, from the unborn Dharmakaya. Remember, unborn means the Dharmakaya never did come into existence. It's, you could say, beginningless. And so if it never came into existence, you don't need to think about whether it exists or doesn't exist. It was unborn free from elaborations in the celestial mansion of self-created indestructible. Okay, now if you have an initiation of Vajrayogini, they have the Tibetan word in here, Dorji now Jorma, um, but if you have the initiation of Vajrayogini, you could do that. I guess if you had Tara, you could put Tara there. Um, you know, I, I live in Mexico and we have um, Guadalupe. You know, it's, of course, it's not the Virgin Mary, it's Guadalupe, you know, and she's very polite and even the Virgin Mary. So I often joke with some of the Mexicans that have become Buddhists and even Tantra practitioners, they said, if 
the Virgin Mary or Santa Maria or Guadalupe took off her blue and white robes, she'd be Vajrayogini underneath that. <laughs> I don't know if they really enjoy that, but anyway, so uh, Tara is Vajrayogini in a more subtle aspect. Okay, but Vajrayogini, Dorji Naljurma, she's, you know, great bliss, red colored body. Uh, dancing on a moon, uh, clear and empty. I stand on a lotus in a sun cushion uh, in the center of a phenomenal force. Now, if you do have the initiation, you have a double stack reality source. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, this is basically like an upside down uh, three-sided pyramid. Uh, it, again, there's lots of commentary there, but it, the, the lower point is beginningless. And it slowly expands up and up until it gets to the top where it's a triangle, okay? A triangle thing. It's like this is a basic reality source. And down inside of it, you have a lotus and a moon, a sun cushion in this case. And then you have the deity standing on top of it, which represents from beginningless time, the lower point, which doesn't have a beginning of the reality source. And the reality source is your mind, by the way that it slowly, when you get into Dharma practice, you slowly expand, 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 until you finally arise as a deity, in this case, Vajrayogini. All, I mean, and almost all tantras, uh, they are within a reality source, or Vajrayogini, for example, in a double reality source. Okay, uh, and then, in, okay, if you do not have any initiations, you just visualize Vajrayogini on the crown of your head. If you have Anatara Yoga initiations, you can be Vajrayogini if you have that. If not, maybe you have Tara, Chittamani Tara. Uh, it is a female Buddha, though. It has to be that. Okay, so I leave it up to you. Uh, if nothing else, I mean, if you don't have any initiations, just visualize that Vajrayogini is on the crown of your head. Okay, and you are inside of the reality source and like that, like something like that. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, in, okay, again, in her heart, okay, which would be you if you have the initiation or in her heart on the crown of your head, uh, is a lotus and sun cushion, uh, so, um, oh, sorry, the lotus and moon cushion uh, at the center of my heart or in the heart of Vajravini. My awareness appears as the supreme and powerful Mila. Okay, uh, he is sitting in the unchangeable mandala of the three cushions. Uh, and they say three cushions is aggregates, elements, and sources, uh, which refers to you know, your five aggregates, your four elements, and then the sources are your, your sense sense doors and sense channels and such like that. It also represents a uh, a lotus moon, uh, lotus moon and sun. But anyway, in this case, it refers to that because again, Milarepa didn't have anything, did he? He was always sort of basically naked. And his right hand beautifully lifts a kanbanga, and his left he holds a skull cup filled with alcohol. His two legs are the prasvajra. Part of his uh, the lower part of his body has red shorts. He wears a stainless white cloth and is adorned with uh, uh, red. It's actually a red meditation belt. It just gives a commentary that it's the color red for the power of activities. It's one circle and it gives it the dimensions for it. Uh, his fuzzy hair. Now, this is where, you know, he didn't have nicely groomed hair. Uh, I mean, he, it's, I remember in the, in the 100,000 songs, it said that uh, when one hunter came across him, he thought he was a demon because his hair was all, you know, dry and, and, and I guess, you know, split ends, <laughs> just frizzed everywhere, you know, I didn't even, he wasn't even in dreads, you know, it was just frizzy hair, he was green colored, incredibly skinny, like that, I mean, just so skinny, you know, his ribs, he's like the, those beautiful pictures of, of, uh, of Sakyamuni Buddha when he did his six years of aestheticism, like that, you know, and so, whoa, so really, you should sort of, I mean, this is blissful Milareva, but he's a bag man, <laughs> you know, his two eyes are looking at his disciples, and he is singing melodious Vajra songs, his body is illuminated by the glories of the major minor marks, and he is surrounded by Daka and Dakinis, this three places are marked by Om Mahom, light rays from these uh, pleading for the supreme exalted wisdom beings, okay, so it's sort of an interesting way to phrase it, but light rays go out and request or plead or hook the wisdom beings. Now, who are the wisdom beings? Really, the wisdom beings are your gurus. So all of your gurus, whether it's Nyingma, Sakya, Gelu, Sakya, uh, Karyupa, or all of the divine beings that ever existed, they are the real wisdom consciousness, okay? And you're going to invoke them and, and mix them into what you call as the commitment being, which is your visualization of Vajrayogini and Jetsa Milarepa in the heart. So you could say that Vajrayogini and Jetsa Milarepa are hollow, like a vase, 
And when you invoke the wisdom beings, they get filled up and you should really feel that like the Dalai Lama is sitting on the crown of your head or Garchin Rinpoche or, or even the Lamas that have passed, Dilgo Kensu Rinpoche. I mean, uh, you, we may, maybe you all know that Lama Zopa Rinpoche passed away. For me, in one way, I feel he's more alive because he's, in the, he's mostly in a pure land right now. And I can call on him a lot easier than, you know, when he was in Nepal, you know, in Nepal, I had to go through a secretary. <laughs> now I have direct access, you know, if, if I have good feelings about him. So in the same way, um, whether you have living or, or gurus that have peri nirvana or whatever, you should feel that they invoke. And of course, the softest ogmen, Akhnishta, uh, the abodes, 24 holy places, the middle of the circle of Dakinis, the soap offering of cemeteries, uh, appear to the faithful disciples and aspirations. Om Vajrasama Ja. Okay, now if, if you're familiar with Ja Hum Bam Ho, Ja is invocation. So, but the Vajra commitment, Vajrasamaya Ja, I commit, I, 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 I call on you. Point number two, we're on page seven. Ah, from the palace of the unborn sphere, Dharmakaya Guru, I invite you to come here. Now, there's a really interesting thing. Like, for example, if you're right now in the Northern Hemisphere, whether it's Europe or America, we feel winter is coming. Now, where is winter coming from? It's coming from the North. But that's not true. Winter doesn't come from anywhere. It's just a dynamic of causes and circumstances or other powered things, which they manifest cold weather. But we often say, oh, summer is coming, fall is coming, winter is coming. It doesn't come from anywhere. Okay, so anyway, unborn sphere, okay, uh, from the increasing spontaneous celestial mansion, Sambhogakai Guru, I invite you to come here. From the palace of the effortless mind, Nirmanakai Guru, I invite you to come here. From the palace of great bliss, Omen, uh, Wang Shu Sherpa Dorji. Wang is power, Shuk is ability. So it's the Tibetan word. Wang Shuk is power ability. Shepa, laughing, Dorji, uh, that's the Vajra. So the laughing Vajra of immutable power, something like that, Milarepa, surrounded by the assembly of routine and heroes and dakinis, realizing the attractive practitioners, Rigzin. Now that's Rigpa Zimba, that's the Tibetan word. Rigpa is with understanding. Remember at the beginning I said, we have Rigpa or Ma Rigpa. Rigpa is I understand, Ma Rigpa is I don't understand. Now, we often say Marikpa is ignorance, but really, if you're going to be smart with your words and the way you refer to yourself, is it's not like I'm ignorant. No, I don't understand. It's a totally different effect on you. Okay. Rigsins are holding, holding understanding, tantric practitioners, holding understanding, engaged in the 10 grounds. So the 10 grounds are the, the joyous and such. You know, after you have, if you have the five paths, Path of accumulation, path of preparation, path of or path of preparation, path of accumulation, uh, path of seeing. So you get your act together, you start to be more and more deeply immersed in your positive energy and feelings and thoughts and everything like that, your bodhicitta and sunyata. And then you arrive at path of seeing. The path of seeing exists for one second, because then immediately you enter into the path of learning. And the path of no more learning, or well, path of learning is your enlightened. Path of learning is the ten, 10 grounds, which is the joyous and other. Okay, you can study that in, in your teachings of the Buddha Dharma. Okay, so all the cities of the 10 grounds, the five paths, all the realized beings, in order to bless me to retain realizations like yours, please come. Please grant great blessings of the supreme place. Grant me the supreme practitioner of the four empowerments, you know, uh, vase, secret, transcendental word. Uh, dispel the obstacles and interferes and mistaken guides. Om Ahum, Maha Guru, Ratna Vajra, Samaja, Ja Ja. Okay, so you're invoking them. And then you ask them to stay. Sitha, since you uh, are the deity of the manifested mandala and the sphere of the emptiness, you are beyond signs of true existence. Uh, please remain in the state of unchanging great bliss in the middle of the Dharma chakra of my heart. Okay, so really you're saying, please be part of my mind. And if you understand a little bit Dharmakaya, you have Buddha nature, Dharmakaya within you. When you take an Anatara Yoga initiation, you are introduced to that. So you are given direct access to Dharmakaya. Now, whether you gain that experience or not depends on you, but the, you are, that's, what you're, that's what's done to you in an Anatara Yoga initiation you transform your five aggregates into the five Buddha wisdoms. 
Okay, with that, then you have been given Dharmakaya. So what's in your mind right now is Dharmakaya. Now, we're too coarse. We're very external. We're always caught up with the sounds and the sights and everything else. So we're very external. We do not perceive things outside of us. Or sorry, we're caught up with things outside of us. So we don't perceive our subtle mind. When you meditate, you shut down the outside world. You bring the threshold of awareness to a deeper internal level. And if you've got sensitivity and awareness, you could then arrive at Dharmakaya. Of course, you'd have to be a really good meditator. Uh, if you really wanted, you'd have to open up your central channel. I mean, this is all part of your tantric practice. But the point is, as I said, in your most profound nature exists all of your gurus. And you could say they're trying to come out, trying to help you. But you're too distracted and running around and things like that. But the thing is, if you have faith, you're starting to move towards that. And actually, what's refuge? Refuge. Alex Burson has a great word he called taking direction. So rather than looking outside, when I take refuge, I'm going inside. I'm taking direction internally. And of course, if we understand Dharmakaya, and the, the Buddhas, all the Buddhas have Dharmakaya, all of our gurus have Dharmakaya, we are going towards that. Uh, Samaya. Vitri la lahna. Again, I don't know what all the watches mean. Prostrations, again, I prostrate. Um, since there is no object, an object perceiver, no apprehender or apprehended objects exists, still you naturally appear and disappear as a self arising spontaneous mandala to you. I prostrate. A ti tra ho tra tra ti jo jo ho. Okay. Uh, illusory offerings. Again, I'm going to go over this quickly because I don't want to run out of time on doing some of the things. Uh, okay, the world we exist, a state of free of uh, illusion, signs of existence, all deceptive and cunning sentient beings. I offer the mode of the reverse process. So uh, on one of the papers, Jonas will give you, he gives you the 12 links. So if I pull up the 12 links here, the reverse, I give you, so I give to sentient beings the reverse order. So that is from aging and death, I take you back to rebirth. I take you back to becoming. I take you back to grasping, craving, feeling, contact, six senses, name, consciousness, compositional factors, and ignorance. I take you backwards to understand your ignorance and then, of course, free you of the 12 links. The mind that apprehends self and mind, I offer the state of extinguished mind and extinguished phenomena. That's, again, a non-dualistic perception of, of that there is a, a relative mind of of misunderstanding that one is not truly existent. All the offerings actually performed mentally imagined, I offer the state. Om ah hom, sarva putra ah hom. Okay, so then make offering. Praise me on mind. Ah, praise for the blissful Sambhogakaya Guru, who is greatly skilled with the five exalted wisdoms. Okay, five exalted wisdoms are the, uh, uh, the mirror like wisdom. The wisdom of equanimity, the wisdom of perception, the wisdom of uh, all accomplishing, and the wisdom of the Dharmadhatu, the, of all phenomena. The body possesses the seven branches of divine grace. The seven branches are, uh, sorry, I have to find, I can list them off, but I'm just making sure I get them right. Uh, okay, seven features of any Sambhogakaya. They have complete enjoyment, they have no delusions. They're always in union with the spontaneously appearing consort. Something that's sort of intriguing for me sometimes is some people sort of think that, you know, I've got to find my partner. Now, definitely there are people in this world who you might resonate with unbelievably, but that person's that person and you're you. There, you, you are not, you can have a great relationship, but, and you can you know, benefit if you're doing high tantra yoga, but the thing is still that person's them and they're you. Um, Lama Yeshi said to me, he said, if you were to do tantric yoga of union he said other than the you know that you embrace in the first moment of your penis touching the vagina or your vagina touching the penis doesn't really matter which side are you on okay in that moment there's this a, a, a static you know this is electric charge that goes through you that breaks up your fifth major wind which is actually the hardest one to draw into your heart chakra. And then you can pull them all into your heart chakra and then you get called either the meaning clear light or the real clear light, et cetera. This is all high tantra. But the point being is that when you do become enlightened, it's not that like you got to sit around waiting in the Sambhogakaya form for that other partner that you had to finally die or I don't get the rainbow body and come up and join you. No, your partner spontaneously 
manifest to you. It, it's not like that you have to worry about somebody that will spontaneously manifest. And if you think about what it is to fall in love, you fall in love with the projection. You see somebody and they sort of match a little bit of your expectations. Maybe you have some strong karma with that person. And so you see them and they go, wow, I, I mean, you're so attractive to me. It's just all a reflection of your mind, truly. Because I mean, in real life, I mean, for those of us that are lay people, you know, we fall in love with somebody and then six months later, we find out who they really are, isn't it? Anyway, so I'm sorry, I'm off on the tangent, but the thing is, there's some things which are always fun to talk about. So union, you will have a spontaneously appearing partner that will be very blissful and you'll just do thing. You'll have great bliss. Absence of being truly existent means you understand, in this case, dharmakaya, uh, the uh, mind basis of all and non-duality. Presence of compassion. Uh, the Sambhogakaya always is compassion, always giving teachings, being uninterrupted. They exist forever and unceasing so that they, they will never cease. And the presence of compassion normally says, if you get to a Sambhogakaya realm, they are always giving teachings. Okay. So sorry, let me go back to the class. Okay, so those are your five wisdoms, body of seven branches of things, clear, exalted wisdom is uncreated, free of elaborations, unthinkable and inexpressible beyond the stream of nihilism and sustained conceptual thoughts, empty of true nature. Um, uh, actually, in uh, April, I'm going to be giving teachings in Ireland with Jonas and uh, <laughs> Jonas and Goshak, sorry. Um, uh, on the Ganges Mahamudra, which I received from the uh, Thunga Rinpoche, a Kargi Lama. And although I'm Galupa, Thunga Rinpoche, a great Lama, and I wanted that lineage. So I sought him out, I, I, I made offerings, and he gave me the, uh, the transmission of it. So that would be a lot around the line, uh, elaborations of the unthinkable and expressible beyond stream nihilism. So if you want interested, that will be available, of course, in, in Zoom. And also, if you want to go to Ireland, the green country in April, it would be nice. Praise to the compassionate Nirmanakaya, who is skilled to do the disciples of various forms. Uh, so the Nirmanakaya, you know, the, the, there's so much to talk about. Uh, the Nirmanakaya is, okay, your guru, and it says in our age, the gurus have to appear really ordinary, because if they didn't, we wouldn't understand them. So they appear to be regular people, and in that way, though, we can have a relationship with them. But from our side, when it says guru yoga, and then you, you know, maybe you all are familiar with, see that the guru is the Buddha. That doesn't really mean you see their body as the Buddha. You see that their mind, their inner being, has all the realizations. They've understood the voidness. They've penetrated their heart chakra and opened their heart chakra. They've gone inside. They've seen the meaning clear light. They've attained the pure clear light. They have the illusory body. Even if your guru didn't have those things, but you have that projection, that's a blessing to yourself. It can be auto, auto blessing. It's your self blessing because you have that feeling. Now, is, there's an expression that if you get too close to the guru, it's like a fire, you get burned because you see their mundane side. If you're too far away, it's cold. You're not getting heated by the fire, so it's not much fun. So you wanna find just the right distance with your guru that you're not so close that you see them with a too, too mundane. You're not too far away that you're cold and you don't see them enough, that you got just the right level. Now, when you have enough faith, you can be anywhere because the guru is always with you. Uh, in the tonka behind me, uh, it shows uh, Marpa coming uh, like um, in the in the story of in behind me. Okay, there's a tree and it shows Milarepa's cloth wagging in the tree, and then it shows Marpa flying there uh, to be with him. And it was one day uh, Jetson Milarepa has lost his faith. It was sort of like the wind blew his clothes away and it blew all the food and I think blew the the fire sticks that he had, the, the kindling he had in his arms out of his hand. And he was so devastated and he just lied down and he said, I'm going to die. And then he called to the guru. And it's a famous uh, song called to the guru. And at that point, then a manifestation of, of uh, Marpa appeared before him and said, oh, Mila, I'm always with you. What's your problem? Okay, you lost faith in me. Okay, so anyway, Nirmanaka, uh, it's, you know, relationships to gurus is complicated. Sometimes gurus you know, have scandals, and that's always a bit of a pain. But the thing is, if you're lucky, maybe your guru never has a scandal. 
and then you can have uh, sort of this nice projection on them. And again, you are blessing yourself the more you have a good projection of the guru. Uh, and if the guru happens to have realization, then they say you've got a, a match, okay? And they appear uh, mundane just so that you can have a relationship with them. Okay, praise to the three secrets of Dorji Shep, but your body cannot be harmed by the four elements, you know, because he, he could basically live in a cave and never get cold. Your speech sings melodious songs, that's the 100,000 songs, and your supreme mind is uncontaminated and meaningful. I prostrate to the conquerors and their sons. This is just to all the other, all the other Buddhas that might be there, and, uh, and Milarepa, okay. Confess, I already talked about confession. Uh, and again, I'm running out of time. So let's just say confession is I open up, I don't hide something, uh, but it's not that I like that, but I say, okay, I accept that I did this and I never want to repeat it again, okay? Uh, and again, the, the text is quite good. Okay, then you have requests. So you request uh, Jensen Mira, practitioner, please bless me. Uh, and then it goes through a variety of requests to, uh, to Jensen Miller Repa. Uh, then to uh, Vajra sound, okay, so Vajra mind, Vajra, or Vajra body, Vajra sound, Vajra mind, or speech, uh, power of meditating, uh, single point of concentration. And then it says in a little commentary there, you should have request with tears in your eyes, being fervent. I only know of one Tibetan Lama that actually confessed that sometimes when he prayed for the benefit of all sentient beings, he started to cry. Uh, you know, so it, it, interesting. But anyway, with great faith to move yourself to tears, and then it says, bless me, this is on the bottom of page 10. Uh, please bless me to be free of dualistic mind. Okay, everything's a reflection of my mind. What I'm seeing is a play of other powered phenomena. And my dualist, my non-dualistic mind is true. Okay, please grant blessings to pacify concepts of pure and impure. Please grant me blessings to be free of expectations of doubt. Uh, please grant me with the accomplishment of the two purposes, purpose of myself and others. Like, may I become enlightened, may I help others become enlightened. Please bless me to realize the lack of inherent existence of the three circles, you know, self, other, and interaction. Please bless me to be pleasure. Please bless me to get pleasure from the objects of enjoyment without conception. And of course, that's the uh, bliss and voidness. Please grant me uh, blessings that may I obtain the three bodies, the Nirmanakaya, Sabogakaya, Dharmakaya. Merely by requesting, Jesse Miller shows the expression of being very pleased. His body remains very still and speedless, and his mind rests in the sphere of freedom, conceptual true existence. And then you recite the mantra. Now, uh, there's this is a different mantra. Om Ah Hum, Maha Guru, Ratna Siddha, Pala Hum. That is not the mantra I gave you. You should substitute the mantra I gave you. As I said, there are different lineages of mantras. Uh, I guess Milarepa, way back when, when he gave his mantra, he might have given one to Rechumba, one to Gampopa, uh, one to uh, one of the other students. So that's where you could have differences of mantra. Uh, we received ours from Lama Zopra Poche, And of course, he's a very, he's very, very good with getting good lineage. He's one of his great qualities of Lama Zopra Poche. So we do Oma Guru. Uh, as we, as I can, I've been teaching too much. I can't remember what I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, my guru. Hasabhadra Sarvasiddhi Pala Hum. Okay, so that's the one we should do. And then it, it gives you some explanations of what to visualize and such, uh, which I'll cover those and then we're going to finish, okay? Because I won't do this. So um, Jonas and Gosha asked me to do a second class. So maybe uh, in the fall, or sorry, we're in fall, uh, at the beginning of 2024, because I'm, Pretty booked up right now. Um, we can do uh, the practice with mantra recitation together online and maybe in person. And then also we can then do soak together again online, most likely. Okay, so just to cover the mantra recitation. So you do get a complete teaching of this. We've covered what's all of the things as preparation, getting close to Milarepa. Remember, what gets us close to Milarepa is the purity of our heart, our feelings, being a bodhisattva. May I benefit sentient beings, the purity of, may all sentient beings have happiness and cause of happiness. And you, Milarepa, you did that. You know, you had the supreme realization. You had the rainbow body when you finally uh, went to the pure lands or whatever. Beams of light radiate from the six types of migrators dwellings. Let's see, hell, ghost, animal, human, demigod, god. And all the individual sufferings and their causes, their negative karmas or obscurations disappear like sunlight on the ground in front of oneself. I uh, think that they achieve peace and happiness. 
in brief, visualize that all samsaric existence becomes empty and you obtain a state of the three kayas by actualizing the three secrets of the jets in both samsara and nirvana. In both samsara and nirvana. Okay, now the, the, you have to remember that there's two perspectives on reality. Relative perspective, everything's a reflection of my mind, it's all other powered. And ultimate perspective, open like the space of the sky. Okay, no, no form whatsoever. Most subtle mind, open like the space of the sky. So when you move to this, you are then cognizing or just appreciating the openness of the space of the sky. Uh, okay, uh, that recite by focusing uh, on one syllable at a time, purify the imprints of the 12 links of independent origination, beginning with first ignorance. Uh, in the end, even though meditating equal pose is like the sky, there's your, your uh, ultimate perspective, beyond all extremes of elaboration, the images appearing to the mind are unceasing. The reflections of an object like, uh, ref like reflections of an object in clear water or crystal, or like signs of, of in a manner of illusion or like images in a mirror. However, they appear, don't elaborate on those illusions. Okay, so what we really do is we exaggerate phenomena. The example I, I, in, I'm right now teaching uh, into a group in America, the, the uh, Ganges Mahamudra. And if you go to a 3D movie, it's the best. You know, you sit in a 3D movie, you got the glasses on, and then the shark you know, boom, 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 comes out, goes over your head and swims back. And you get goosebumps, you know. And all you do is you lift up the glasses and you go, whoa, that's not real. You know, now, of course, we tend to keep being terrified of the shark. But the thing is, you know, we don't know it's not real. OK, put them back on and go, Ooh, I'm back in there. Or um, there's some really good ones where there's mountain climbers they, you know, like climbing a cliff and they got these little cameras on them. And that just gives you massive I don't know, like uh, what's their thing, uh, agoraphobia, you know, like, uh, you know, so like that, then you lift the glass and okay, it's just an illusion. Okay, anyway, so that's how, phenomena, we exaggerate them into more than what they really are. Uh, so we should try to assume that. Yeah. The mind having those appearances is all pervasive. This is your, your mind basis of all, without a trace of inherent existence objects, without any inherent existence object to view and view and free from all dualism, a meditating agent and meditating object, meditated object. So it's big, big practice of the, everything is a reflection of my mind. My mind, if it's non-dualistic, is a true mind, uh, et cetera, okay? Um, now they, they do the soap, we won't do that, okay? Because it's quite elaborate, but we will do just the uh, dedication. Uh, dedicate without apprehension of true existence. Uh, this is on page uh, 16, just to complete this section, okay? Ah, by these virtues, may I and all others be liberated from the dualistic mind and attain the holy state of our only father, the omniscient guru. Ah, just as the Jetson remains till the end of samsara for the benefit of others, may I be like him. With the awareness that doesn't see birth and death as truly existent and is not subject to the signs of change. Ah, by the auspiciousness of the knowledge, love, and ability of Milarepa, the yogi whose essence is beyond expression, the unceasing compassion, compassionate one, whose nature is spontaneous like a vajra. May the whole country be auspicious. May there be auspiciousness of the Dharma flourishing. May there be auspicious of the expansion of the Dharma holders. May there be auspiciousness of all the migrators having, having joy and happiness. May there be the auspicious of manifesting Buddha. Okay, so that's an hour and 15 minutes, and that's sort of what I dedicated towards this. So uh, you have the text, you can go back and read it. You have some things that uh, Jonas and Gosha will share with you uh, that are um, some of the little extra added things you can add, add to this. Um, and we will do uh, the we will do the practice. Again, I'll review it, and then we do the practice in the, I guess, at the beginning of January 2024, and we'll do it. So, so that's something we can wait for with anticipation. So uh, that's good. We've got to create the causes and circumstances for things. Um, I'm really, really happy to have done this presentation because for me, 
and I'm so sorry for my translator. He must have just exhausted himself. But anyway, that's all I remembered. Oh, because I'm a translator. So I know that translating is difficult. And he's doing simultaneous translation. So right now, he must have a massive headache. But anyway, thank you very much uh, to you for doing the translation. But anyway, back to the commentary. Um, this is, I, for me, this is so meaningful. Like Milarepa represents the purity of good practice. And not to say that our other gurus that have monasteries and things don't have pure practice, they do. It's just, it's a little bit easier sometimes when you look at somebody that really doesn't have anything and yet they're totally dedicated to the Dharma, like Milarepa, like Kunalama Jetson Lama, like Mingir Rinpoche when he was in his retreat, like really pure thoughts. I mean, his book is so moving because he talks about that state of being of just non-attachment. And actually, uh, just from because I'm in a Catholic country, uh, I've been I studied a little bit about Saint Benedictine, you know, the founder the founder of the Benedictine monastery. I think he was a he was a rebirth of Milarepa. If you read his story, like he had a deep spiritual moving, he walked off and he went into a cave and just started to meditate. And then one day, a Benedict or a monk, not a, a Christian monk of some sort, came along and gave him some clothes and. And this and that, and then stuff. He's almost like the um, Ramana Maharishi. Again, this is so pure, like no strings attached. Just he went and crawled into the big temple of Shiva, you know, in uh, Tiruvannamalai, and sat there for months, and just sort of had the you know, rats bite his body and stuff, and things like that. Finally, when they they opened up the temple and pulled out the big chariot that was for Shiva, there he was sitting there, you know, meditating. And then, they, then he walked up to the cave in the mountains. I mean, it's so pure. I've been to Tiruvannamalai and actually I've done meditation in his little room where he sat. Very pure, very holy. I mean, those, those are people and you know, definitely, I mean, all the holy lamas are holy and special, but there is something in this somebody who really didn't care about that stuff. You know, just, they were the, the, the spark. Milarepa was the spark. Buddha Shakyamuni, he did six years and he was a crown prince. I mean, he had incredible wealth. He could have said one day, I'm tired. I want to go home and get a massage. And he didn't, you know, he basically did six years of aestheticism and then he gained realization. And then he presented the nature of reality 2,500 years ago. I mean, you really check up like the philosophy of Buddhism. It holds up to scientific inquiry. And yet it's got faith and it's got spirituality and it's got states of consciousness. So precious. And then the Vajrayana, I mean, for those of you with Vajrayana, you're so lucky because now you have tools to go and access your own Dharmakaya, your own Buddha nature, you know, with the, with the different yogas that you have and taking death bar to rebirth. I mean, there's so much. We are just so lucky. Okay. Precious human rebirth. We got it. We won the lottery ticket. Okay. There you go. So uh, that concludes what I want to talk about. Um, we can dedicate. And uh, I can see there's 33 chats. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at them in a few secs, but okay. <laughs> Dedicate. So, by the uh, may truly Miller, Jetson Miller Rapa, you know, come and be part of my consciousness, help me make better decisions, help me have spiritual determination. And not just that may I have that, but may I become really able to go and help others. I'm doing this not just for myself, I'm doing this for others too. And so that concludes the class. Uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna just before Jonas, before you turn it off, let me just see. Oh, there, there, there there's the, someone put the pictures of a, a Mipa Rinpoche. I've heard the black tea. Uh, okay, yeah, the, the, the monks and nuns should use black tea for inner offering. Um, but it is supposed to be alcohol. But bottom line, it's supposed to be high protein. Okay, that's the real thing. Okay, uh, recovering alcoholics. Okay, yeah, I guess maybe you should just use uh, water or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with that because, you know, recovering alcoholics, it could be touchy. Okay, then there's, uh, can I share these files again? Okay, Sarva City Paula Home, Paula Home. Uh, Okay, there's, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but the thing is, uh, it, it can, it mean, anyway, it could mean protection things. So thank you very much, uh, Ramana Swami. Okay, uh, as I say, I, Paula, I think of the uh, Dharmapala, 
but as you say, I, I'm not <laughs> actually just a, just a joke. Okay, when I took refuge, uh, or I actually took my ordination as a monk, I couldn't speak Tibetan. And Tibetan is a tonal language, so you have ka ka ga ma. Okay, and I didn't know that. So anyway, I took refuge in the in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So I was saying, uh, you know, Sangha like Kapsu Chio, Cho like Kapsu Chio, Sangha like uh, Gedan like Kapsu Chio. But when I said the word Cho, I was saying Cho because that's what I understood. Okay, and that was yogurt. So so the Lama that gave me my refuge was uh, Geshe Raptan and Lama Geshe actually they laughed at it at the end of the day. He said, Look, John, but you're taking refuge in the Buddha, you're taking refuge in yogurt, and you're taking refuge in the Sangha. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Ramana Swami, thank you very much for, for clarifying that. Uh, just that uh, re the results and foods are protection. So uh, again, I'm not up on the on Sanskrit. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, every, I think that's pretty much it. So good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Lama Jampa, for that uh, excellent teaching. Uh, we would like to offer you a mandala. Okay, sure. Sashi, Perky, Jokshik, Meto, Tram, Rara, Blinkshin, Yedek, Yampa, De, Sanji, Shing, Domek, De, Powa, Yi, Droka, Namda, Kshing, La, Chirpar, Shum, Om, Idam, Guru, Ratna, Mandala, Kam, Yir, Yeta, Yame. Thank you so very much. And of course, thank you all for tuning in. We will upload that teaching on YouTube. And we will send you later an email with all the files that we also put now in the chat, but we will also send it via email. And of course, tomorrow Lama Jumper will be teaching, giving a general teaching on offerings and on Saturday and uh, Chenry Z empowerment. And we will also give you the Zoom links in that email with all the files. Yes. And anything else, just uh, keep on checking your emails for future events with Lama Jumper. We'll uh, notify you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, hi, Cliff. Nice to see you there. <laughs> and some of you other ones that I don't know very well, but we'll slowly get to know. Big hugs. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.